I'm very happy to be sort of talking about this topic at the start of the conference because this is this is a talk that actually was born from attending conference conferences and and talking to people at events like Codemesh, um, where I often have this really interesting feeling when I go to a talk about something that's completely different than than what I'm doing, that is all very interesting and I can see how the reasoning works. It's just sort of feels somehow strange or alien where you if you're if you're a dynamic programming language person and you come to a hardcore haskell talk you'll be surprised you'll, you'll sort of see that this makes sense but why and um this is one of the one of the greatest things about conferences like code mesh where you can really experience some very very different ways of thinking um and this always sort of got me got me wondering why is it that we can talk to each other, we can collaborate, but somehow some of the ideas that you encounter feel really, really quite different than what you're used to. And um, why is that? Um, so that was one of the motivations for the talk. The other one was, was reading about philosophy of science, uh, which is my, my favorite topic. Um, and one of the sort of most basic things or one of the sort of very influential books in the philosophy of science is a book called Structure of Scientific Revolutions which challenges this idea that science is, is sort of purely progressive enterprise where we keep sort of adding more knowledge to our massive pile of knowledge and keep getting better and better. So the idea of, of Thomas Kuhn about um, scientific revolutions was that science doesn't just sort of progress by adding more stuff, but sometimes there's an event where everybody's way of thinking dramatically changes. And that also means that some of the past ideas stop being comprehensible to, to people. And um, it's sort of a break in this, in this, in this thinking. And um, that doesn't quite happen. I think that doesn't quite happen in computer science or in programming where generally you can understand what um, other people say, but uh, there's an element to it, which Thomas Kuhn calls incommensurability. And that's, that's this sort of idea that some, sometimes um, you encounter an idea that sounds consistent, sounds scientific, but it sees the world differently. And I think this is in a way what happens in, in programming about many um, basic things. So if you, if you think about how do you specify what a program should be doing, some people will be writing elaborate specifications, some people will be developing that through talking to customers. Um, if you think about how to avoid errors or how to use things like types, how to make sure your programs work. Um, if you think about what does object orientation mean, um, if you see an, a talk by someone doing OOP in, in Java with design patterns and LMK, you get two very different perspectives. Um, and today I, I sort of wanted to look at thing that I think underlies many of these things, which is what kind of activity is programming? What, what is it that we actually do? And I'm going to be using these, these different cultures of programming as my sort of um, way of telling the story. So um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about hackers, mathematicians, businesses, engineers, and creative cultures as a way to make sense of what's what's happening and i'll sort of give you a few examples and then try to reflect a bit about what these things are and why is it useful um so the one thing that i find really remarkable is that i think many people here can relate to these different ideas and uh, to, to these different cultures but it's not something that sort of just happens now because we're in a certain we're using computers in a certain way. Um, I'm actually going to go all the way back to 1940s, where I think you can trace very similar ideas, very similar cultures, all the way back to the first computers. So this is my first, first scene. And we start in 1946, when the ENIAC com computer was introduced. And that raised the question, how do you control such a machine? Now, ENIAC was programmed by plugging cables. So this is very, very different world. Um, but even then, the, the first sort of reactions to this prob problem were by the, the people in the military 
So that's the, the sort of business where computers were used, who said, well, surely this is just a scientific instrument like oscillator or other things. We'll just subcontract subcontract that, give a specification, get back our, our program, our computer that does what we need. Um, the, the hackers who were trying to actually build these machines, build these programs, realized very quickly that this is actually really hard um, and started sort of fiddling with the machine to try things out, see how to, how to make it work. Um, but even in the ENIAC times, all this fiddling got quickly a response from, from people who were more mathematically inclined. And they were saying, well, maybe we should sort of figure things out logically before trying. So you'll, you'll see some, some examples of these different ways of thinking soon. Um, and that was ENIAC, the, the first machine. The, um, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but the second notable computer was ETSAC, which, was, um, which differed in that it stored the program in the memory just like it stored the data. Um, and did that change anything? Where for, the, for, the, for the hackers, they still really had to sort of fiddle with the machine to see how it works. This got a little bit easier because you could enter the program on punch cards rather than by plugging cables, uh, but it's still very fiddly. But a, a new thing that became possible thanks to this idea of storing uh, both the, the program data and the program itself in the memory was that you could start engineering, um, building sort of tools within the computer to help you. So that the first obvious thing was rather than write everything as a huge list of instructions, you could start introducing subroutines. And that was what I think is a, is a nice example of an engineering innovation where you use the computer to make the computer programming easier. And um, this, this development is something that was very much appreciated by the, the businesses because the fiddling with computer where you sit there and block the really expensive machine for hours is just amazingly expensive because you just have one computer. Um, so that allowed, made it possible to, to um, make sort of let, let computers be fully controlled by operators who would just take your stack of punch cards and feed it to the machine. So this is the, the sort of outline of my, of my first story. And um, I'll say a little bit more about some of the interesting events there. So this is about ENIAC, which as, as uh, Betty Jean Jennings Bartik said, was son of a bitch to program. Um, and she was one of, the, one of the now famous for a long time forgotten six, six female programmers, the original programmers of the ENIAC who were actually figuring out how to do this thing. Um, she's written an autobiography, which I do recommend. There'll be more, more on that on the next slide. Um, and she's providing a really nice account of what was it actually like to program the ENIAC. And as you can see here on the, on the previous slide, the way you did it was actually by plugging cables. So there was no source code, there was no uh, instructions. You had different components that you had to rewire to, to make it um, do the thing you wanted. But it still had, had um, five buttons um, that will be familiar to anyone who's ever been debugging any program. There was button to start it, stop it, make it run the next instructions. Um, quite interestingly, you could also di disconnect a program pool's cable which was basically the, the timer that kept it running. So you could do it, you could debug the machine just by actually sort of stopping it and, and inspecting all the states, which is again, what, what you do when debugging. Um, one sort of curious fact about the ENIAC was that this was in the early days when hardware was as bad as, as software, um, or at least as bad. So very often you could, you could um, the error could have been not just because you programmed it badly, but because of a blown tube. Um, and um, another interesting fact is that what the, what the early programmers did is basically invented test-driven development in the 1940s. Um, they had a sample program 
that they were, uh, it was calculating a trajectory of a missile and they calculated the whole thing by hand and then they could debug the machine by sort of letting it run that calculation one instruction after in another and checking whether that's right. So um, you, had, you had a test first, which was your sample trajectory, and then you could make sure that the mach machine matches. Um, but even in the, in the very early days, you can already see some tensions about how to best do this. So um, what, what Betty Jean, Jean says in, in her autobiography is um, she worked on various projects with Adil Goldstein, and she says Adele was, a, was an active type of programmer trying things very quickly. I was more laid back, and um, um, when I was trying to figure out some things, I tried to figure this, it out logically before actually doing anything. And I think this is, this is already a sort of tension that you get these days as well between the people who are more hackers and just want to sort of fiddle with it until they get it to work, and the more mathematical approach where you start thinking about the problem and, and try to really get it sort of right before you even start coding. Um, the next thing was the, the EDSAC machine, which was built, um, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around because um, there was sort of immediate follow-up to the ENIAC in the States. I'm jumping to the EDSAC, which was built in 1949 in Cambridge, um, mainly because there's, a, there's nice accounts of how the programming of that machine worked. And this differed in that you didn't have to plug cables around, you actually had a, had a um, machine that loaded the instructions into memory from, from some punch cards and then followed those instructions. Um, but again, when, when um, people re recall how they were debugging these things, you really, the, the basic thing that they started was, with was you, you debug the program by sitting at the console, executing it instruction by instruction and observing the registers and the memory. Um, back then you could actually see the memory, so that was, that was a lot easier. These days you can't really look at the memory, you have to have a tool for that. Um, but it's still the sort of hacker approach of actually looking straight into the machine to see what, what state is there. Um, and this was, this was, again, very expensive because you have to sit at the machine for a long period of time. So um, it triggered various really interesting ideas. Um, and there's a, there's a nice review paper by Martin Campbell Kelly uh, that documents some of the very early history. And two of the really interesting ideas that, again, you'll, you'll recognize these days are a post-mortem routine. So this was a program that you added to your, to your punch cards that would print the store. And when anything went wrong, you would get an output of what was the state of the program when it crashed. So um, that's, your, that's your first memory dump. Um, more, more interesting and, and very clever thing that appeared again in 1940s or er, early 50s was a checking routine. This was a program that um, you load it into your, into your EDSAC and rather than actually running your, your real code on the machine, it basically worked as an interpreter in modern terms. Um, so it went over the instructions, um, interpreted those, and it printed some diagnostic information as it was going. So it made your whole execution 20 times or something slower, but you got a really good um, record of what's going on during the execution. Um, and I picked those two examples because they're the kind of engineering, engineering solutions to the obvious problem of debugging the, the computer, where you use the resources of the computer to build new tools to help you program it better. Um, so, so far we've seen, we've seen a few different cultures that kind of represent various ways of approaching the machine. The, the hackers are the ones who always interact with the machine very directly. And um, one interesting aspect here is that this is really hard to record. So um, the kind of knowledge you get through that is often sort of individual expertise and you have to find Go to the go to your local local hacker to learn how they actually do things. Um, 
There's the mathematical culture, which treats programming as a, as a mathematical challenge to be solved logically. And this is, is uh, one of the sort of surprising benefits is that you get something that actually is easier to write down and, and share on paper. Um, we've got the engineering culture, which is trying to build new tools to help us control the, the, pro the, the computer using the computer itself. And throughout, we've seen the, the business or managerial culture, which um, mainly tries to control the, the, the development process in some way by either sort of outsourcing things or um, limit or sort of protecting the machine from its users in a way. Um, so all those, all those different approaches, which I think you'll, you'll recognize in many situations these days, they are also apparent in the very, very old days, sort of 1940s computers. So um, I'm, I'm going to go through one more scene, one more bit of history, one more slice of history um, in 1950s, 1960s. And this is when the, the um, by then the programming has really became batch processing. So you had an operator, uh, you took your stack of punch cards, brought it to the operator, and a few days later you got your result or more likely an error, uh, a memory dump with all your errors. Um, and at this point in, um, in MIT, people started building experimental machines um, like TX0, there's a few more, um, which were more interactive. So this is really a machine that people started sort of um, sitting there and interacting with this. And the question is, what, what does this change or how that sort of affects the, the uh, kind of programming we can do? So this is something that, um, triggered a, a whole hacker culture around it and if you if you um, there's a book called um there's a book on on hackers at mit and this is all about that so um the hackers were the kind of people who were absolutely excited to sit there during the night trying to sort of fiddle and see, see what the machine does and modify the program as you're as you're um as you're running it um as you're as you're sort of developing it so um, the interaction was really important to the hacker community because it gives them something that it, it's sort of necessary for, for their approach, for uh, their kind of programming. Um, of course, the, the business people were still very upset about this because this is a machine that cost $3 million. And if you just give it to some undergraduate hacker who sits there for hours, that's, that's such a huge waste of resources. Um, so one idea that appeared that um, uh, in, in response to this is, well, maybe we could enable the same kind of interactions by, by letting multiple users work concurrently with a single machine. And this led to the idea of time sharing, where you just connect it to the machine via terminal. And it looked like you were, you were uh, programming it live, even though there were many other people sharing it. Um, so again, this is sort of an engineering response because we use the machine to solve a problem that um, we use the computer to solve a computer problem. And um, one thing that got enabled by, by both, both the sort of very early interactive machine and by time sharing is it actually allowed a yet another culture to enter the scene. And this is, this is my artistic or creative culture which um, very often came, came with from the perspective of education as well. So people started thinking, well, um, this is really something you can do creative things with. You could teach it to kids to have, to have fun with computers and with programming. Um, and time sharing worked, worked quite well for this um, to some extent, but um, many hackers were, were not ex exactly satisfied with that because they said if you want interactive interactive computing with screens which was a, a, a new thing then the computers really need to get cheap enough for an individual to have full access to it so i'm going to again 
give you some more details about bits of this story and then try to reflect about what this, what this means, what this teaches us about the different cultures. Um, so the, the TX computer, um, again, this is sort of going back to the, to the idea that you can, uh, users can just debug their programs by sitting at the console, sometimes for hours, and um, as it happened in the, in the MIT hacker culture, this was usually at night. Um, so um, you have the, the direct access to the machine. You can actually sort of see what's going on, um, experience it. And um, it's amazing how little there or how, how sort of hard is it to, to actually learn how, how people did this. Um, if you look at what's been written about, about that in the, in the history books. And I think that's because one of the sort of key characteristics of the, of the hacker culture is that it's, it's kind of knowledge that's really hard to write down. Um, you sort of, how you, how, you, how you debug a machine by interacting with it is something that you learn just by watching over other people's shoulders. Um, and um, there's, I think that's, that's, that's a thing that still holds today where certain kinds of things that you do with computers are really hard to document, and the best way to learn them is, is to watch over other people's shoulders while, while they're doing it. Um, the, the TX computer also allowed um, new creative user uses. So um, Ivan Sutherland was, um, is, is well known as the creator of Sketchpad. Um, so that was on, on this very machine. Um, which is a system that um, had sort of a, a, a virtual pen that you could use to, to um, draw shapes and create, create drawings. Um, and that pretty much relied on this interactivity combined with a, with a sort of um, using computer to, uh, to a creative, creative problem. Um, there was the obvious issue that something like the TX0, TX2 computers were just too expensive. Um, and that triggered two parallel developments. Um, there's, a, there's a nice account of this in Severo Ornstein's um, uh, autobiography, where he's, he's uh, a person who contributed to many of these developments, who draws this distinction between big dealers um, like um, big groups in the, in the MIT and the IBM, which came up with the idea of um, time sharing. So you sort of connect to the machine and it um, alternates between users so that they can use it at the same time. And the, the small dealers who were people trying to build machines that would actually be cheap enough for an individual. Um, and he was involved in, in one of the projects called Link uh, which was a um, um, small, quote, quote, machine that um, they actually could, could use in, in medical imaging and so on. Um, but the, the point is, um, we have the sort of engineering response to this, to this hacker idea of, I really want to control my machine, that's to build time sharing. Um, there's the sort of, I think, more, more hacker approach of actually, I want to have my own machine that I can fully control. Um, but both of, these, both of these developments, both the sort of personal machines you could control um, and the time sharing were, I think, a, a precondition for more creative users of, uses of computers in the 60s. Um, one is Sketchpad, which I mentioned. So that's the, that's the um, software where you could draw um, to sort of communicate um, with the machine. Um, the other was the logo programming language. And I'm, I'm very happy that we have Cynthia Solomon, one of the creators of logo, talking about it later in the conference. Um, but um, so, so logo was a programming language aimed at sort of teaching thinking to kids, uh, not necessarily programming, but thinking. Um, and what I find really striking about these is not just like this is this is yet another cool program we can write on a computer. Um, what I think is really really fascinating is that when they talk about what they do, they use completely different language than anyone else. So um, when I'm talking about cultures of programming, 
I don't think it means just sort of approaching problems differently. It really means thinking about the, the computer differently. And if you, if you read what Ivan Sutherland says, where he says, Sketchpad makes it possible for men and a computer to converse rapidly through the medium of line drawings. Or if you read Ellen Kay's Reflection, who says, the logo was a revelation. This was more like environment of powerful epistemic uh, ideas, the environment of media. They really see it not as um, a sort of program, as an artifact. They see it as, as something you, uh, through, through which you live, through which you experience the world. Um, and um, that's something that was sort of enabled by the previous developments, and it continues to, to um, um, influence many, many future ideas in, in the world of programming. Um, now, of course, um, why, why, why is it that if you, if you have kids and they go to school, they don't start with logo? Or um, why don't you go back to your work after the Code Mesh conference and, and program in Smalltalk? Um, and I think that part of the response is that those, those ideas from the creative culture are often sort of competing with the, with the business culture. And in case of personal computing, the, the business culture strikes back in the 1970s with the development of VisiCalc. And um, there's a paper I'm quoting, which is sort of reflection on the history of VisiCalc, which starts by saying, it was one of the two application products together with WordStar that were really the software underpinnings for the explosive growth of the personal computing industry. So um, it turns out that what the, what the business culture really needs is not powerful media for, for communicating or powerful media for thinking. They need to build tables and work with documents. And that's something that can be very well supported by, by end, end user applications like VisiCalc and WordStar. And I think it's sort of ironic that the, the history of VisiCalc actually links back to the MIT hacker culture and that the sort of interaction you do with the system is, is very much inspired by that, but it completely lacks this, this sort of openness of, of small talk or the TX0 machine where you have full control over anything and can fiddle with it arbitrary. Um, so what have we got so far? Um, we've got, again, the, the hacker culture, which really sort of uses the computers, uh, not just for solving specific business problems, but for exploring what can be done with computer. And that often requires a full control over the machine so that you can do possibly unexpected things. We've got the, the business culture, which uses, uses computers to solve uh, specific problems. Um, but it's not just, it's not just that, um, that sort of someone outside of the computing world. I think that the business culture very much also affects the, the way you interact with computers um, by, for example, not, not favoring the, fact, the, the approach that you can sort of make arbitrary changes anywhere. Um, we again have the, the engineering culture which solves computer problems by developing more programs, um, such as the, the time sharing idea that um, made it possible to, to um, interact more directly but at a reasonable cost. And we have the, the new, newly appeared, newly joining creative culture, which um, uses computers as, as new media, often in a, unexpected ways. And um, I find it interesting that I, I don't think there's any fundamental reason why education needs to be the focus of the creative culture, but throughout the history, it just seems to be one of the natural areas where maybe people think, well, us adults, we are already, already too far. We can't be, we can't be um, made to think differently, but with kids, you can, you can teach them a more creative way of thinking about computers. Um, so I'll have one more story to wrap up with, but I want to say a little bit about why is it that I'm actually doing this? Why does this matter? Um, and um, so far, I've been really sort of 
in the talk, I've been looking at the past and I think the idea of these different cultures of programming um, gives you a nice way of reading or interpreting what's happened. So you can, you can uh, look at various historical developments, be it time sharing or, or things like types um, and see that as, as different interactions between cultures. And sometimes the cultures clash and just disagree, um, which could be about how you, how you should specify your programs, whether that should be done mathematically or whether that's more of a human process. Sometimes they collaborate. I think types would be an example where lots of different cultures with lots of different ideas sort of came and joined forces um, to develop new ideas. I think it's equally important for the present um, in at least two different ways. One is that um, if you're aware of these multiple different cultures, I think it gives you really nice way of, of stealing interesting ideas from other places. So um, even though um, you might be working in a, in a very much an engineering oriented department organization, uh, you can often find really interesting ideas somewhere out there and integrate them. And I think for, for understanding that there's other ideas, it's really useful to be aware that there might be different cultures. I think another practical, um, important practical benefit here is to avoid misunderstandings. So um, next time you, you go to a, to a conference talk by someone who comes from a very different perspective, I think being aware that they might be thinking about the problem differently, not just, not just about solutions, but the, the very question, the, the very sort of, um, the, the very problem definition is different. The, the very approach to thinking about the problems is, is different. I think that can give you a, a better perspective. Um, I think this also is, is relevant for thinking about the, the future. Um, and I see I've got my title wrong here, so that that should be that should be the future, where um, some of the interesting developments in the past were when one culture encountered a new idea from another culture. Um, so, for example, the, the creative culture was only really possible when when computers became more interactive. And I think you can you can. Um, look at interesting developments and see how they could be brought to a different way of thinking, um, possibly giving you some ideas for something new and unexpected. Um, also, I think it helps you to sort of uh, see that there are places where, where um, interesting, interesting ideas might be happening. If you look at the various creative uses of computers, I think that's, that's one space where we can possibly steal a lot of good ideas from. Um, so the, the last bit, the, the last uh, story that I want to follow is about what kind of activity is really programming. And I think this is, this is perhaps the most fundamental of the, of the sort of uh, bits of history I'm, I'm talking about because it really sort of questions the very nature of programming. Um, and um, the, I'll, I'll start with um, this, this sort of observation that the very idea of a programming language is a metaphor. When we, when we say language, we're, we're actually, um, programming languages aren't languages in the same sense in which German or English is a language. So why do we use this metaphor? And um, the first question is whether this is just an accident or whether this is something fundamental. Um, the, the mathematical cultures would say this is not an accident, but the, the language here refers to formal languages in terms of logic. So um, to program is really to manipulate some terms in a formal, formal language. Um, and um, the, the mathematicians really believe that, that a programming language and a language of logic are fundamentally the same things. Not everybody will agree because if you're a hacker and you really are concerned about how you get full access to the machine, you, you see it more as bits in memory. And that's maybe an exaggeration, but um, you really sort of don't think about 
um, high level abstractions like language, but more about what is actually there. Um, the creative culture, and this is what I was mentioning before, um, they see it, they see program, they see programs as something very different as a, as a medium that you can interact with. So the children who program turtle with logo or, um, or computer artists see it more as a medium, not necessarily as a, as any formal, formal object. Um, one interesting consequence of, of this sort of thinking about um, program as language or not language is that when you see it as a medium, it, you're sort of tempted to be able to um, arbitrarily change your programs. So if you're in a small talk world, you can sort of navigate through your objects that exist in the, in the world and you can arbitrarily change them, which is something that's very much scares the business, business culture that wants to keep some control over things. Um, on, on the other hand, if, even if you, if you think of programming as a language, you can actually look at those creative applications um, like Logo, or, um, which, is, which is one of the sort of languages where you had very interactive, REPL-like programming experience and, and sort of bring those ideas into the language world um, of more formal formal thinking, so a um, lot of ideas from from small talk or or logo um, do exist in modern programming languages, um, but maybe we don't really think about them the same way as the people originally used to. So um, I think if you look around, you you'll see that a lot of um, the the idea that programming language is really a sort of formal language or um, a program is a bit of text that you manipulate, possibly with the help of some tool. Um, that seems to be a very dominant way of thinking. Um, but um, I think there's, there's still places where this is not the case. So the, the creative approach, which doesn't really see programs as, as textual entities, still exists in, in various corners. Um, such as um, when you're doing data science or when you're doing life coding. Um, so there's a there's a nice paper that documents this this birth of the language metaphor by uh, David Nofri and Mark Priestley and uh, Gerard Alberts, um, where they say um, where they document this this sort of shift from notations as attributes of individual machines, where every machine just had its own instruction set, to notations as being something that exists on its own and it's based on symbolic logic or, or linguistics. Um, and I think this this sort of language programming as a language is is something that's very dominant today. The most obvious a pro, um, opposing approach was, was in small talk. Um, and um, this may be because small talk really has these creative origins. And uh, there's a paper on the design of small talk by Dan Ingalls, where he says the purpose of small talk is to provide computer support for the creative spirit in everyone. So it even explicitly acknowledges this, this creative link. Um, and it also relies on this, on this sort of ability to see inside, where he says, um, if a system is to serve the creative spirit, it must be entirely comprehensible to a single individual. So there's no sort of, uh, there's, there's um, no unbreakable hiding. You can always look inside and see how things work. And the interaction with small talk is nothing like working with a, with a, with a text. Um, um, where in, in, the, in, this, in this design paper, they also say a user interface is simply a language in which the communication is visual. So um, it's still using the language idea, but the, the communication is not, not by sort of writing, but by the, the visual interaction. And um, again, we can see this, this sort of um, need for accessing everything uh, in a quote that says, every component accessible to the user should present itself as a 
um, in a meaningful way for observation and manipulation. So you should, you should be able to sort of fiddle with everything that is there in the machine. Um, why do we not program small talk when it's, when, it's, uh, when it's so much better than anything else? Um, there's, a, there's a recent blog post by Gilad Bracha um, who points out two things, and I'm, I'm, not sure, um, I'm not sure to what extent those are fundamental, but I think they do illustrate interesting observations about the culture. One is the, the lack of standard where um, every small talk vendor had a slightly different version, not so much of the language, but of the, of the platform. And this really points out that in, in small talk, the, the in, important thing isn't just the formal language, but it's the whole environment that you interact with. So um, rather than talking about programming languages, you really have to talk about programming systems. And it's relatively easy to standardize programming languages because you can treat them as formal objects. But if you talk about the whole programming environment, the programming system, that's something that you can't sort of boil down to a page of, of crazy looking equations in an academic paper. So um, small, it's just another illustration that Smalltalk really relies on a different way of thinking, um, which is, by the way, one that I find very much, very much interesting and I'm sort of, um, really curious to see how that could be adapted to um, more contemporary programming environment. The other point um, in that blog post is about deployment um, and the fact that uh, in small talk, the, the program sort of is part of this sea of objects <coughs> containing both the program and the data. And you deploy it by shipping an image um, and um, the, the obvious problem with that is that if you want to separate it from the IDE and, and the, the whole sort of infrastructure that lets you arbitrarily modify the program and see the code, for example, to protect your intellectual property, this turns out to be very hard. Um, so I, I find this as, as yet another nod to this sort of hacker idea of you really need to be able to, to interact with everything and see inside. And uh, that, has a, that has a characteristic which makes it somewhat at odds with the, with the business culture of, of closing things and, and making them products. Um, are there still, so, so even though we don't all program with small talk, I think there's still areas where that more interactive approach is very much alive. Um, and if you've been to any of the previous code mesh talk, code mesh conferences, I think you've seen Sam Aaron doing a live coded performance, playing music using Sonic Pi. Um, and even though this is just based on a normal programming language, I think the, if you if you experience it, it really is different kind of interaction with a different kind of medium. So that to me is one source of interesting ideas. Um, more sort of boring domain is exploratory data analytics, where if you're using something like Jupyter Notebooks, um, again, you'll be using normal programming language under the hood, but the way you do it is in this, in this very interactive environment that lets you adapt and, and um, share notebooks with others, you can then adapt them as well. Um, in, in data analytics, the end product isn't some sort of program you built, but it's that, that notebook itself. So again, you, the, the code is part of the product. And I think that's another area where um, possibly it's a space for a lot of interesting developments. Um, there might be some interesting ideas arising from there about how we can program. So, um, Thinking about what, what kind of thing is programming, the, the mathematical culture is really sort of viewing it as a formal language. And uh, the one practical coincidence of this is that it works very well for academic research because if you have formal languages, you can study them, you can talk about algorithms, you can talk about, um, you, can, you can sort of write all the theory of programming languages based on that idea. But it 
it misses some really important uh, factors. The, the business culture tends to see programming more as sort of building of closed artifacts um, that are then can be, can be sort of sold or provided as a service. Um, the, the creative culture has a very different idea and um, you're not really sort of so much about building programs, but it's about interacting with this media that allows new kinds of expressions. And um, we still have the, the hacker culture, which actually wants to have sort of full access to what's inside these programs. Um, and that's not just because they're sort of old fashioned and like their assembly language, that's, it's more because this actually gives you a, a way to do new unexpected things with the machine. Um, and I think when you, when you think about sort of what kind of thing is a programming, you can see that the, how these different approaches clash and, and often collide just because their they're sort of fundamental requirements and fundamental assumptions are, are quite different. To conclude, I want to say a few things about what we learned by thinking about the history of programming using this idea of cultures of programming. So there's a few, few points I want to make. First of all, I think the idea of different cultures is something that's here to stay. Um, so if you, if you imagine what in 1940s, 70 years ago, um, you could think that maybe it's just because people really come from different backgrounds. There's, there's electrical engineers, there's mathematicians. But as we saw, this isn't something that was just sort of there in the 40s, but it's something that continues with us. And if you, if you look at um, the different talks you find at CodeMesh, um, you'll see that people really still sort of come from these different perspectives. So I think this is the, the idea that there's different cultures is something that's very fundamental about programming. Um, the other point is that the cultures aren't like in, in Kuhn's paradigms, completely different worlds that don't talk to each other at all. In programming, the different cultures interact in many interesting ways. They might clash over basic principles, some believe that programming is fundamentally mathematical. Some believe it's more about interaction, uh, but they also collaborate. And uh, through this, they often improve the programming practice. So very often people from different cultures sort of contribute to one technical idea, like the, the very idea of programming language or types and help to make it better. And I think it's useful to think about or to know about cultures of programming because it's something that actually helps us understand both the controversies of the past, the current debates, and maybe even some of the future ideas about programming we might be getting. So for example, when you, when you think about hiring, this is a typical example where um, people often ask questions that come from the mathematical culture, regardless of what they're actually hiring for. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. And um, the final point is when you're thinking about programming, it is useful. It might help you to think about the different cultures. And as far as I can, I can say, I think mathematical engineering culture, hacker culture, business culture, and the creative culture do capture most of the interesting ideas about what programming is and how it should be done. Thank you and enjoy the rest of CodeMesh.